Hey everybody, it's Mr. N here, and this is a quick 10 minute, well, it's actually gonna be more like 15 minute conceptual review for the AP Calculus test. So let's start off with limits and continuity. You need to know how to take the limit from the left and right and determine if it's continuous. It's continuous if f of x exists and these limits from the left and right also exist. To evaluate limits, first do the plug-in method, plug it in. I call it brute force, see if you get an answer. If, it, if you don't, try to simplify it, then plug it in, see if you get an answer. If it's indeterminate, use L'Hopital's. Remember a couple things. If you get an answer that's one over a very large number, which is infinity, then that equals zero. If you get one over a very, 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 very small number, then that's gonna be infinity or it does not exist. Horizontal asymptotes, make sure you know how to find them. Um, you are actually taking the limit as x goes to plus and minus infinity of f, and f, of f of x. But for rational functions, there is a shortcut. If you end up with a rational function, I suggest using the Algebra 2 method, which is to compare the highest powers of the numerator and the denominator. So if m and n, these highest powers, match, then a over b is your horizontal asymptote, y equals a over b. If m is greater, then you will, it, you'll have a bigger value on top, so you won't have the horizontal asymptote. And if n is a bigger value than m, bottom will be much bigger, it'll go to zero, so you will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. All right, let's talk about rates of change. To find the average rate of change, it's always calculated over an interval. So just be aware of that. So we are gonna take this over an interval from A to B, and that is a secant. So you end up with the average rate of change as being delta Y over delta X, which is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. And also we can consider it to be F of X minus plus H minus F of X all over H. So that is a secant. The average velocity will be delta Y over delta T, where S is the position and T is the time. Acceleration will be the change in velocity over the change in time, where A is the acceleration and T is time. Instantaneous rate of change, here we go. This is the difference between average rate of change and instantaneous. Instantaneous happens at a point. It's always calculated at a single point, and it's the tangent line. So it's the slope of the tangent line. Instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent, which is M tangent, which is equal to this, which is a limit. And here we go, limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f x over h. This is the definition of a derivative, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So moving on, now as far as instantaneous velocity is concerned, we're gonna say that this is ds over dt, change in position over change of time, and instantaneous velocity is dv over dt, change in velocity over the change in time. But again, these are derivatives because they do happen at a single point. Now as far as derivatives are concerned, this is the slope of the tangent line, so you need to know your definition of derivative and here's the first thing we're going to talk about, which is the product rule. Product rule is the first time to derive the second plus the second times to derive the first. Make sure you know that. Over here, you can see it is as f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x. And now it leads us to the quotient rule, which is the derivative with respect to x of f of x over g of x this time. We can write it out in formula format like this, which is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the of the bottom over the bottom squared. Okay, so now moving on, as far as the chain rule is concerned, this is huge in calculus. We all need to know how to do the chain rule. And the chain rule is pretty much prevalent everywhere. So basically the chain rule, if you have a composition of a function, what you have to do is you need to take the derivative of the function itself and then take the derivative of the inside of that function. In class, we talked about it like those Russian dolls. You have to keep going inside for all the interior parts. So make sure you practice a bunch of chain rule questions. Look at uh, my examples that I have on other videos. Inverse derivative, make sure you understand the inverse derivative. The inverse derivative of x is one over f prime times the inverse of x, so know that formula. No, make sure you know when it's, some, when it's not differentiable. The most common one is a kink. So when we see a kink, we'll know it's not differentiable there. If the limit from the left and the right diverge, it is not differentiable, and if the limit is undefined at that point. Um, the next topic we wanna talk about is implicit differentiation. So make sure you understand that if something cannot be solved for y directly, then you're gonna have to separate it out by taking the derivative of x and y each. So every time you take a derivative of y, you're gonna write dy dx or y prime, and every time you take a derivative of the x, that will just be dx over dx, which is one. And then you solve for dy dx, which is y prime separately, and so that's the basics of implicit differentiation. Again, make sure you practice those. Log logarithmic differentiation doesn't appear often on the A-B test, so we covered it, but it really probably won't uh, be into play. Applications of derivatives. This is huge. Remember, derivatives are tangent lines, so you'll always see information about tangent lines. 
Make sure you understand the basic equation of a line. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. When we are writing a tangent line, don't simplify it. Leave it like this because sometimes you may make that mistake simplifying and then it will be wrong. So remember, slope is dy dx, which is the derivative at that point. So that's the big major application. All right, let's talk about some curves and behavior. So what can we do with these curves and behavior? First of all, you will know critical points. If you have a critical point, that's when F prime equals zero or undefined. That's the biggie, or undefined. That gives you a critical point as well. If it's increasing, F prime of X is greater than zero. If it's decreasing, F prime of X is less than zero. Concave up, now you're taking the second derivative, F double prime greater than zero, F double prime less than zero. Make sure you use a number line uh, method. That, that's the test method I recommend where you compare um, on a number line such as this, where you have F prime and F double prime, and you can also compare them to know when it's increasing and concave down or decreasing concave up, etc. All right, to find maximums and minimums, you get the critical points and make sure you test them along um, with your endpoints if you're going for absolute maximum and minimums. So make sure you test the endpoints if you're trying to do absolute maximums and minimums. Inflection points, now it's when the second derivative equals zero or undefined yields the possible inflection points, but then we have to put them in a number line and test. Okay, a lot of applications, related rates. For related rates, determine your givens and what the rate you need to find. Use an equation for the situation. Sometimes it's the Pythagorean theorem. Oftentimes it'll be the Pythagorean theorem. And then take the derivative of that implicitly with respect to time, which you will lead to have dy dt, dx dt, etc. So next up is optimization. And remember, for optimization, you are looking for absolutes. So use the steps we talked about earlier. And remember, it, when you're looking for where it occurs, that's the x value. And if you ask for the value, then you're looking for the y. For integration, Riemann sum is the integral. You know your left, your right, your midpoint, and your trapezoid. Trapezoid is typically their favorite on FRQ. Uh, midpoint, not as much, but midpoint probably will appear somewhere on the um, multiple choice. Use a table of values given. Often they will not be evenly spaced, so be careful with that. Overestimate, underestimate, know how to figure out if it is over under. Draw it out. So draw it out, and if you get a situation like this where you have left endpoints and the curve is increasing, obviously you're going to have an underestimate, whereas if you did right endpoints, it would be an overestimate. And then for trapezoid rule, same kind of concept. Draw your trapezoids out to determine if it's over or underestimate. And then when integrating, make sure if it's below the axis um, that this is a negative area. So it's okay to put a negative area because we are looking for net areas. As far as FTC, remember there's two parts of FTC. One part says the integral is the area under the curve. So if we have a curve, we are looking for this integral under the area, and that would be the integral from a to b of f of x dx equals. Now, this is the integral. We get the capital function f, which is the antiderivative from a to b, so that would be f of b minus f of a. Okay, next up, remember the second part. The derivative of the integral is the original function, but don't forget to take the chain rule into account. So if we take the derivative of this right here, we end up with the original function, but with a chain rule involved. Remember, a is the dummy variable. X is what you will need to do the chain rule on. Okay, so now as far as applications of integration, okay, right here, an area we could find that bounded between a line or axis. Remember, it's going to be if it's two curves, it'll be the top curve minus the bottom curve, or if it's just the curve minus the axis. Okay, if we have volume, volume is the integral of the area. Always remember that. Always start off with that. When we talk about volume, volume is always the integral of the area. If you can get a function for the area, then you integrate that and that will give you the volume. So now if we are talking about thicknesses, we'll have dx is your thickness or you could use dy depending on how you are slicing it up. Know uh, your disk and washer methods. Disk is for one curve, washers for two curves. So if more than one curve, which would be the washer method, remember you have an outer radius and an inner radius. You square those. Don't forget the pi out in front. Why is it pi? Because we're rotating. So when we're rotating around the axis, we are going in a circular motion, so we need to have pi there. If you are doing this about a line, then r minus the line of rotation, r minus little r minus the line of rotation. That's if the line is below it. If the line is above it, then you're going to flip-flop these. Remember, it's always going to be big minus small. If the line is above the radius, then it's the line minus r. All right, moving on. Okay, so remember, always take your slices perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So the slice is perpendicular to the x-axis or the y-axis. So if we're going this way, these are my slices, and then that would mean I'm going to rotate about the x-axis. So I'm going in this manner. 
So my slices are perpendicular like this, all right? And if you're going about the Y, that means you're going in this direction. So now we're gonna have a thickness of dy because my slices will go up like that. So those are volumes of rotation. Now, if we are dealing with volumes of cross section, with known cross sections, remember, the volume is the integral of the area. We keep saying that, the volume is the integral of the area. Find your area equation, whether you have a square, semicircle, rectangle, equilateral, triangle. Those are the most common. Find out what equation it is, use the equation for that, and get an area. Once you get that area, rotate it. Moving on to net change. Net change is typically, we see it on FRQ as rates entering, rates leaving. So you'll have the integral of the rate that enters minus the rate that leaves. That's going to give you the net change or total amount of people, fish, whatever they're asking for, cars that enter a parking lot. So this can appear also as a table of values where you have to do Riemann sums to find this. They've also done one where the table of values are Riemann sum and one uh, such as they enter or the leave and then the other one with an equation. So you've had to done, use both in one uh, situation. Average value is one over B minus A from the integral from A to B. So if they ask for the average, that's what you can do for the average value of it. And this can appear in both a table format or an equation. So motion applications. Okay, let's take a look. If you have X of T, that's your position. Uh, take the derivative, you get velocity. Take the derivative of velocity, you get acceleration. Derivative of acceleration is obviously the jerk function, but they won't ask you about that. Take the integral of acceleration, and we're going backwards now, you get the velocity. You take the integral of velocity, and you get position. Remember position, they can use X of T, F of T, or S of T. Uh, moving right or up is when the velocity is greater than zero. Left or down is when the velocity is less than zero. If speeding up and slowing down, you have to de look at the V of T and the A of T and determine if they have the same side, you are speeding up. If they have opposite signs, then you are slowing down. Next, we have if you take the integral from A to B of V of T to T, that's your change in position. That is the change in position. However, if I want to know the total distance traveled, I would need to take the absolute value of this right here. Now, break it up on a number line where it's going moving backwards and where it's moving forwards and take those different absolute values. So those are the parts that you integrate when you put together and then you will get the total distance traveled. Next, we have differential equations. Now, they can ask you for slope fields. I often see people forget to draw the horizontal one. Give the horizontal one. So, because you get points for everything. So draw in every single point Point that they give you and clearly draw it in, darken it in so they can see it. And if they ask for any solution curve to draw, draw that solution curve. Next, they'll definitely ask you on separation of variables. Make sure to separate the y and dy, x and dx. Integrate each side. You will get points for just the integration part. Remember, often we'll see maybe an ln. If you have one over x, you'll see a natural log there. Okay, and then make sure you put in your plus c. Okay, do not solve for it yet at this point. Make sure you plus your plus C to get those points. And now plug in the initial condition before you solve for Y. It makes it much easier. You're gonna get a point for this. And also on FRQ, they're gonna want that answer for C. After you get that, now you can solve for Y. Remember, often you'll have, as I said before, LN or E, so make sure to review how to integrate these. All right, for MVT, IVT, and EVT, all of these require thing, the function to be continuous on A to B. So if they say if it's differentiable, then you automatically know that it's continuous. Often they'll say it's twice differentiable, so we know that you could take the second derivative as well, and it will be continuous throughout. EVT just tells us that it's going to have an absolute maximum or minimum, so that's what EVT is. IVT, that just means that there is a point in between, and I like to use this particular situation where you graph it out. Here's A, F of A, and B, F of B right in here. So if that means if I connect A and B, there's got to be some point here C, and it's got to be right in there as f of c. So it means that there's got to be a point in between. So that's intermediate value theorem. So in IVT, we're mainly talking about points. When we get to MVT, now we're talking about slope. Remember, it also must be continuous, and this time it has to be differentiable. So the average here equals instantaneous. The slope of the secant equals the slope of the tangent. Here's the equation for a secant. Here's the equation for a tangent, which is a derivative. So MVT, we're talking about slopes, and it's where this time when I connect the secant from A to B, I will have a point where I get a tangent that is parallel to the secant. I also like to use the example if I'm in the car, I'm going, I average 100 miles per hour. At some point, I, my instantaneous velocity had to be 100 miles per hour. So finally, make sure you look over my videos on the six typical questions usually asked. I did these as shorts. They're gonna usually ask you accumulation, particle motion, area volume, uh, Riemann sum, FTC derivative graphs, and differential equations. I went over the basics of the conceptuals of these, and you can always check out my other YouTube videos on specific problems that involve. So obviously this was quick and conceptual and didn't involve a lot of problem solving. You can check those videos 
where we actually problem solve. And we didn't cover every single thing in this. These are just major concepts that I think you should know. So thanks for watching. Hit that like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video. And good luck on your AP test.